God's glory. Romans chapter 9, elected for God's glory. While you find your way there, just want to say thank you once again for your prayers. Thank you for your sacrificial giving to our new sanctuary, to the phase two building. Uh, been very blessed. I don't know what happened overnight, but uh, we've just had weeks of fantastic weather. And that's been a great help to our Masons. Uh, the brick exterior on the building is about 60% uh, complete, and we should be completing it uh, in the next uh, two weeks or so, trying to get the building closed in and before the, the really cold winter weather gets here so that we can keep working inside all through the winter. Um, and thank you for your patience uh, with the parking lot. We should be getting the parking lot put together in the next week or two. Uh, we have some sidewalks to pour. There's a new promenade that goes down the center of the parking lot that corresponds with the uh, front entrance to the new building. And as soon as we pour those sidewalks, we're going to pave and we're going to stripe everything. I was saying to the staff, uh, you know, I work here and when I pull in, I don't know where to go. I, I, I don't know which way to turn, I don't know where to park, um, but we should get the parking lot together. And so thank you, thank you for your patience uh, while we're trying to get that done and uh, we'll, 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 we'll make it. We might not look like much when we get there, but we're gonna make it, so thank you. Um, and then uh, just a word about our service on Tuesday evening, Thanksgiving Eve Eve. Uh, for years, uh, we have had a service the night before Thanksgiving. It's one of my favorite services of the whole year because you do the preaching uh, as you give testimonies to good things the Lord has done. And um, we moved it to uh, a couple of years ago. I was on Riversville Road in Greenwich going under the merit on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and the traffic was bumper to bumper in both directions. And I said, it's so hard to get around on the night before Thanksgiving. So we moved it, Thanksgiving Eve, we moved it to Tuesday, and we call it Thanksgiving Eve Eve. And uh, at seven o'clock, we'll be here for worship and testimonies, and I hope you'll join us. Look with me in Romans chapter nine. Let's talk about elected for God's glory. Romans chapter nine, I'm going to begin reading in verse one. Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself could be cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. The reason that uh, Paul is in sorrow and in anguish is because the Jewish people have rejected Jesus as their Messiah, and so they are cut off now from God's people, and he wants to see a change in that. He goes on in the next couple of verses to list eight blessings that the Jewish people enjoyed, the covenants, the law, the glory of God with them, the patriarchs, and most of all, uh, they are the line through whom came Jesus, the Messiah. Let's pick up reading in verse 6 of chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it's not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated at the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated." Now, those are pretty strong words out of the mouth of God, but I want you to understand that it doesn't mean that God hated Esau. It simply is a Hebrew way of saying that he chose Jacob over Esau, all right? So don't get too upset. Uh, it just is a way of saying God chose one over the other. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens 
whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does the potter not have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble pur purposes and some for ignoble purposes? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he has called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Let's pray and ask the Lord. This is a very difficult passage of scripture, uh, but the Holy Spirit is going to help us to understand it. And you're going to be speaking in tongues by the time we get done with Romans 9. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us. Father, I just pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. Open the ears of our heart, Lord, the eyes of our heart. Give us the ability to receive your truth. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, his method was to partially quote the word of God and thereby misquote it. He used the same tactic in the garden with Eve. Has God really said? And then he misquoted what God really said. And he still uses that same tactic to lead believers astray today. Partial knowledge of the word of God is his favorite tool to fool us. Partial knowledge of the word of God is what he uses to bend your thinking in a carnal direction so that you come to believe something that is precisely opposite of what the word of God says. Partial knowledge of the word is what he uses to lure you into disobedience all the time believing that it's obedience. And how did Jesus answer the devil in the wilderness? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by... Uh, I'm sorry, what did he say? But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Beloved, we have to eat the whole scroll of the word of God. Some parts taste sweet, like the glorious crescendo to Romans chapter 8. If God be for us, who can be against us? But we must also eat the parts that are sour in the stomach, like Romans 9. Who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and harden whom I want to harden. You see, there are some verses in Romans 9 that present a picture of God that is hard for some people to stomach. It doesn't jibe with how they have fancied God to be in their own imaginations. It's important that we understand the meaning of Romans 9. Romans 9 is important because it tells us that Christianity didn't just appear out of nowhere in the first century AD, but it was part of God's cohesive plan of salvation from the very beginning. Buddhism was founded by Siddhartha Gautama in the fifth century BC. Hinduism evolved over a period of centuries and coalesced in the writings called the Vedas at about 1200 BC. Islam was founded in the 7th century AD when Muhammad claimed that the angel Gabriel visited him. But when did Christianity begin? Well, it began in the heart and the mind of God before the foundation of the world was ever laid. And it began unfolding in human history on the same day that mankind fell into sin. Romans 9 is important because it tells us that we're part of a whole plan of salvation. God's comprehensive plan to save the world. A plan that started with a promise in the garden and ran through Abraham and Moses and David and Jesus and Paul and now has come to us. Another reason that Romans 9 is important is because it tells us that even though the majority of the church is presently made up of Gentile believers... God is not finished with his people Israel yet. There's a critical issue in Romans 9. 
Since the majority of Jewish people have rejected Jesus and the gospel, it calls into question whether God has really kept his promises to Israel. Because if God has broken his promise to them, what guarantee do we have that he'll keep his promises to us like the ones that we celebrated in Romans 8? But in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul answers that God has indeed kept his promises and he will yet keep them. A remnant has believed and God is not done with Israel yet. And we have an obligation to Israel to pray for their salvation and to lay down our lives sharing the gospel with them. A final reason that Romans 9 is important is because in looking at God's past dealings with Israel, God has words of encouragement and correction and warning for us. Paul said everything that happened to them is written down for our example. This morning I want to share a word of encouragement with you. Looking at Israel's history, what does it mean that God has elected us? There are two key words in Romans 9 that come from the same root, the word election and the word called. They are really the same word. To be elected means to be called by God. To be called by God means to be elected. So what does it mean that God has elected us? I see four things in Romans 9, and I want to share them with you quickly. What does it mean that God has elected us? First of all, elected means that we are called to experience a supernatural birth. We are called to experience a supernatural birth. What does it mean that the majority of Jews have rejected Jesus as their Messiah? Does it mean that the gospel is not true, that Jesus is not really the Messiah? Or if the gospel is true, then it must mean that God didn't keep his promises to Israel. But Paul's answer is that God has kept his promise because a remnant of Jews have believed, and that's the way it has always been. There has always been, Paul says, an Israel within Israel. There has always been a true spiritual Israel within the larger physical Israel. Abraham has always had, Paul says, two kinds of children, physical descendants and spiritual offspring of the promise. Ishmael was Abraham's biological son, but Isaac was Abraham's spiritual son through the promise. Esau was conceived at the very same time as Jacob. Same father, same mother. But God elected Jacob to be the spiritual son of the promise. Paul says that God elected Jacob over Esau in the womb before either of them had a chance to do anything good or bad. Not Ishmael nor Esau but Isaac and Jacob were chosen to be in the train of God's blessing they were chosen to have encounters with the living God like their father Abraham they were chosen to receive the righteousness that comes by faith they were chosen to host the presence of God to receive his divine intervention in their lives they were chosen to know God and to represent him on the earth Paul talked about that Israel within an Israel in Romans 2. He said, a man is not a Jew if he is merely one outwardly. No, a man is a Jew if he is a Jew in his heart, circumcised. In Romans 4, he said, those who have the faith of Abraham are the spiritual offspring of Abraham, the recipients of the promise. In Romans 9.24, Paul says that God has elected and called even us both Jewish and Gentile believers on Jesus. He's called us to be born of the promise, like Isaac and Jacob. He's called us to be in that train of blessing that comes from Abraham. He has called us to have encounters with him, to host his presence. He has called us to know God and to represent him on the earth. Without taking any attention away from Israel... I want to pause to point out that what Paul said was true of Israel is also true of the church today. There is a church within the church. There are some who regard themselves as Christians, 
simply because they were born into a Christian family of one stripe or another. Perhaps they were baptized and confirmed in a Christian church. Maybe they were on the Christmas and Easter plan. Maybe their parents took them every week to Sunday school and youth group and to church. But like Ishmael and Esau, they have never had their own personal encounter with the living God. They are children of the flesh, not children of the promise. But within the church, there are others who have had an encounter with God. There was a divine moment when God called their name and they responded to his call. For Abraham, the call came while he was working in the family business one day. For Isaac, the call came when he was about to move his family to escape a natural disaster, a famine. For Jacob, the call came in a dream one night while he was running from the consequences of his own deceitfulness. For Peter, the call came after a very bad night of fishing. For me, his call came softly on my bed one night when I was eight years old. When did his call come to you? When was that moment that the still small voice of God spoke, spoke to the innermost part of your being? And even if you didn't understand it all, you just knew that you knew that you believed. Do you know what my prayer was that brought the presence of Christ to me? It, it wasn't theological. It wasn't, didn't have all the, the steps of a sinner's prayer. I simply said, God, I want everything you have for me. And the beautiful presence of God came to me, and he has never left me since. Whether it was through tears, or whether it was with awesome trembling, or whether it was with a sense of overwhelming peace, or whether it was with billows of great joy, you simply heard him call your name, and you said yes to him. To be elected means that God has called us to experience a spiritual birth. God has called us to a moment of believing on Jesus that begins a process that changes everything in our life. Jesus called it being born again. With tears, like Paul, I say that not everyone who attends church has had that experience of new birth. Have you? Could today be the day when God wants to call you? What does it mean that God has elected us? Four things in Romans 9. It means, number one, we're called to experience a supernatural birth. Second, elected means that we are called to submit to the majesty of God. We are called to submit to the majesty of God. Beloved, everybody listen to me for a moment. When you have had an encounter with God, it creates a humility towards him in your heart. It leaves you with a sense of awe about him. It leaves you with reverent fear in your heart. It leaves you in loving submission to his leadership. That was not the attitude of Paul's critics. Paul's critics complained that the Jews' rejection of the gospel must mean that God has not kept his promises. Paul's immediate answer is that God has kept his promise because a remnant has believed and that's the way it's always been. But then the critics came up with a follow-up complaint. Well, then God is unfair to choose some and not others. Paul answers them in these verses that the fact that anybody is saved at all is only because of the sheer mercy of God. It's no surprise that some, that many may be lost for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The surprise is that anyone will be saved at all for no one deserves salvation. Like Pharaoh in Exodus, many have hardened their hearts to God and through their unbelief have prepared themselves for destruction. The surprise is that God has prepared some to receive mercy instead. Paul uses a very familiar Old Testament metaphor to remind us not to go too far in our questioning of God. Who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? 
Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Doesn't the potter have the right to make what he wants out of the clay? Beloved, listen to this. People who have never had an encounter with God always bring him down to their own level. They judge God according to their own standard of right and wrong. They evaluate him by their standard of fairness, as if they know everything God knows, as if they can see everything that God sees. In Psalm 50, God says, Psh, you thought I was someone like yourself. I will rebuke you. Watch yourself. Don't forget who I am. In Isaiah, God says, as the heavens are very high above the earth, so my ways are much higher than your ways, and my thoughts are much higher than your thoughts. Job spoke a little too lightly about God until God showed up in a storm one day. And he said, who is this that darkens my counsel with ignorant words? Where were you, Job, when I laid the earth's foundation while the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy? When God finished with him, Job put his hand over his mouth and he said, Oops, I've said too much. Surely I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me, therefore I repent. You know, the Pharisees invited Jesus to sit at a dinner table with them as an equal. Rather than seating Jesus in a teacher's chair and sitting at his feet and learning from him, they invited him to sit at a table on a level plane where he was their equal. He, they barraged him with their clever questions. They analyzed him against the rubric of their own logic and religion and morality. But a sinful woman who had had an encounter with Jesus wept at his feet and lavished an extravagant sacrifice of worship on him. You see, that's the difference between those who have had an encounter and those who have not. Those who have not had an encounter analyze. Those who have had an encounter simply adore. Beloved, I say this with tears like Paul, but a lot of people who call themselves Christians speak too lightly like Job. And they put Jesus on an equal plane with themselves like the Pharisees. Their assessments of God and Jesus are rooted in their own sense of fairness and morality rather than in what God has said about himself in his word. Now I know that's a little tight, but it's right. People are saying God is like this and not like that. God would never do this. God would never do that. And I would never worship a God who would. Jesus would never condemn that sin. Jesus would never condone that hellfire and brimstone preaching. Their picture of God and of Jesus is shaped more by the values of our fallen culture than the truth of God's word. That's good preaching right there. Have we really surrendered to the majesty of God? Have we surrendered to God as he has revealed himself in his word and in his son? Have we surrendered to the absolute sovereignty of God? God does whatsoever he wills and he is perfect in all of his ways. The standard by we measure God is not the, our own human notions of morality and fairness, but the standard by which God is measured is God himself. If God does it, it's right, even if we don't understand it. If God says it, it's true, even if it doesn't seem fair or loving to us. Some, many, will harden their hearts like Pharaoh against God and so prepare themselves for destruction but others God has chosen to become objects of his mercy even us who are you O oh man to talk back to God perhaps like Job we need to put our hands over our mouth and say oops I've said a little too much surely I've spoken of things 
I don't understand things too wonderful for me. Therefore, I repent. What does it mean that God has elected us? Four things in Romans 9. God has called us to experience supernatural birth. God has called us to submit to the majesty of God. Number three, elected means that we are called to endure in faith while God is patient with sinners. We are called to endure in faith while God is patient with sinners. One of the things that causes us to question God's fairness is the persistence of evil in the world. Why does God allow evil people to carry on for so long, especially when they're persecuting his own people? Why did God allow Hitler to torture and murder six million Jews? Why did he allow Stalin and the Soviet regime to imprison and murder more than 12 million Christians, at least double the number of Jews that were killed, and some believe it may be as many as 20 million Christians? Why does he allow ISIS to continue butchering Christians in the Middle East and across the northern tier of Africa? Why does he allow Boko Haram to rape and butcher Christians and enslave their young daughters in West Africa? Do you know that there are 70,000 Christians estimated in prison labor camps in North Korea, imprisoned by Kim Jong-un? Why did God allow the Hebrew slaves to suffer under the Egyptian whips while Pharaoh hardened his heart again and again and again. Paul says that the reason is God's patience. He's giving sinners every opportunity to repent. If anybody knew about the patience of God, it was Paul. In fact, Paul says that God made him the ultimate Example of patience. Paul was the ISIS of his day. He was a murderer of Christians. He was a persecutor of the church. But he wrote later to Timothy, here is a faithful saying, worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy so that in me, Jesus might show his immense patience as an example of those who are yet going to believe on him and receive eternal life. Peter knew something about patience too. On the night he was handed over, Peter denied Jesus three times, but he too received mercy. And so later he wrote, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some consider him to be. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. In Romans 2, Paul said that many people misunderstand the patience of God. They mistake the fact that he doesn't come down, that he doesn't respond swiftly with justice. They mistake it as a green light to go on in their sin. Now, God's patience is very good news for sinners. It's good news for our loved ones whose heart are still hard, but it's bad news for us. God's patience with sinners means prolonged suffering for us. God's patience with sinners means that our grief and our vexation over the sinful things that they do is prolonged. It means that the persecution that they heap on us for his namesake is prolonged. God's patience with sinners means the sorrow and the burden that we bear over their lost condition is prolonged. Romans 9 opens with Paul's anguish, his grief over the lost condition of his own people, Israel. I wonder, do we feel that too? In a few days, we're going to gather around the Thanksgiving table with our loved ones and with some not so easy to love ones. Does it bother us that those who don't know Jesus are going to hell? Do we grieve over it like Paul did? Do we feel the level of sorrow that Paul felt? Is it personal for us like it was for Paul? Do we feel a burden to do something about it that Paul felt? You know, no matter which way you hope the election turned out, how do you feel about the other side if you believe that they're without Christ? Maybe you feel angry about the anti-Trump protesters 
They've been called the cupcake generation. I think it's a disgrace that our vice president-elect was disrespected at a Broadway show this weekend. But if you believe that they're without Christ, do you grieve for them? Maybe you're angry at the Trump supporters. They've been called racists and bigots and misogynists. But if you believe that they're without Christ, do you grieve for them? Are you angry like the rest of the world or do you weep like one of God's elect? You see, as followers of Jesus, he hasn't given us the liberty to hate those with whom we disagree. Wasn't it Jesus who said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute you? You know, I feel from the Holy Spirit like maybe there's someone here and right now you're holding on to your right to be angry. You feel entitled to your anger, but in Christ, you are not entitled to anything other than the love of God. Nobody was ever mistreated by the Jews more than Paul, yet look at Paul's love for them. Beloved, listen to me. It is time for us to stop affiliating ourselves too closely with the splintered factions of this fallen world and to affiliate ourselves with the kingdom of God instead. You see, our citizenship is in heaven and we await a savior from there, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Trump, never Trump, left, right, Democrat, Republican, millennials, baby boomers, without Jesus, we are all objects of God's wrath prepared for destruction. And right now, God is being patient. So rather than getting our gander up, why not weep over that? Why not pray about it? Why not do something about it? If you want to join a movement, how about you join the Jesus movement? How about you join the gospel movement? How about you join the how shall they hear unless they are told movement? You see, the only kind of love that trumps hate in the world is the love of God that was manifested in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the love that God pours into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love of this world will never trump hate. Not that it's totally insincere, but it's just not pure enough or strong enough. The love of the left and the right will never trump hate. The love of Black Lives Matter will never trump hate. Pro-life love, pro-choice love will never trump hate. LGBTQ love will never trump hate. Only God's love in us, his elect, will trump hate in the world. What does it mean that God has elected us? Four things in Romans 9. It means, number one, we have been called to experience a supernatural birth. Number two, we have been called to submit to the majesty of God. Number three, we have been called to endure in faith while God is patient with sinners. And finally, elected means that we are called to glorify God through our patient suffering and our eventual vindication. Worship team, you can come help me. We are called to glorify God through our patient suffering and our eventual vindication. Be careful that you don't go too far in your questioning of God. He is not like one of us. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. God allows some stuff to go on in this world for a while for the purpose of patience, giving sinners an opportunity to repent. And he allows us, his people, to go through some stuff for the purpose of bringing him glory. You see, while God was bringing plague after plague on Egypt, he was giving Pharaoh more and more opportunities to repent. And while the children of Israel were suffering under the Egyptian whips, God was being glorified more and more. The whole world was watching the showdown, and when it was over, the whole world was left trembling in awe of the God of Israel. When we patiently suffer for Christ, God is glorified by our resolve. We have a friend from Baghdad, Iraq, Canon Andrew White, pastored a church of once 8,000 people in Baghdad. 
Nothing's left of the church now. He's had to leave the country. He's in Israel. But from Cannon White, we've received reports of ISIS fighters converting to Christianity because of the resolve of our brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, even in the face of torture and death, they refuse to renounce Christ. The ISIS fighters are seeing Christians. They're, they're seeing the peace that they have, the resolve that they have in death, and they recognize that the Christians have something inside that they themselves don't have. They're baptizing ISIS fighters by the dozens, sometimes as many as 50 or 60 at a time, in makeshift baptistries dug in the sand in the desert. Paul wrote about that to the Thessalonians who were under extreme persecution. He said, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecution and trials you're enduring. All of this is evidence that God made the right call about you. Our patient suffering for Christ is a powerful testimony. And when God finally vindicates us, he gets all the glory. Two million children of Israel walked out of slavery with all the gold in Egypt and the whole world was watching. Pharaoh was finally broken and he said, the Lord, God of Israel, he is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. And the same is true with us. God might let some stuff go on in the world. He might let us go through some stuff. But when he brings us through, the world will know that the Lord, he is God and he is with us. We have been elected for God's glory. What does that mean? It means we're called to experience a spiritual birth. It means we're called to submit to the majesty of God. It means we're called to endure in faith while God is patient with sinners. And it means we're called to glorify him through our patient suffering and our eventual vindication. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today.